Welcome to The Truth In This Art. I am your host, Rob Lee. And today, I have the privilege of speaking with political scientist, strategist, business owner, speaker, author, change agent, polymath, which is a great, great title. Um, distinguished presidential research fellow at Johns Hopkins University. Please welcome Dr. Maya Rocky Moore Cummings. Welcome to the podcast. Rob, I am so pleased to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, absolutely. I feel like I had the longest line of things to say. And I was like, I got to get everyone in. I was like, I know I missed one. I'm and when you impress me, you got a lot of them in. So, <laughs> you know, it's a version of like online stalking in a sense, but professionally. Right. Um, so I like, like to really start off by asking like guests, their, their vital stats because they, you know, sometimes people will say, I'm really more so this. Like mm. you, you've, been, you've been on LinkedIn and people say, oh, I'm a tech, I'm a tech evangelist. It's like, what is that? So if you will, could you give us your vital set? How do you like present yourself? And like, what is that number one thing for you, Maya, of this is who I am. This is what I do. It depends on my audience, frankly. Okay. And the fact of the matter is, is that it's a kaleidoscope because I am a business owner. I am a policy analyst. I am an academic. I am an activist. I am like an author. I'm all of these things. Yeah. And so it depends on who I'm talking to, what I uh, primarily put forth. But on Instagram, I actually like my title there. I start with I'm a human being because people are confused about me. Mm -hmm. They don't understand uh, my particular mix of experiences and, you know, titular titles or whatever. And um, they don't know quite what to make of me. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that I'm a human being who loves people, who loves community, uh, who loves the planet. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, this is about making this place better than what it was when we came on board. So. Yeah. I, I think that is the, the best one, probably. I think that's, that's mm -hmm. out there. I, I omitted human. That's the one I forgot. You know, it just wasn't there at the time. Yeah. Um, so. And, and, and again, these are going to be, you know, however you, you really want to frame them. I think they're, they're kind of broad in some ways and some, in some other ways, they're very direct in the questions. So in terms of like that summation of like being involved with community, being involved in, in liking people, being an activist, things of that nature, what are some of the, the, the ideas, some of the concerns, objectives and such that really motivated that focus and that attention to that sort of work? I am, have been driven almost probably since birth by the fate of the black project here in the United States of America. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's probably because, you know, I'm the fourth generation from slavery on um, both sides of my family. Uh, I grew up, uh, my parents were the product of the Jim Crow South. Um, even though we grew up uh, living in places around the country and abroad because my dad was military, mm -hmm. uh, the fact of the matter is that my parents and my mother was trained as a teacher. My dad was always well-read and you know, focused, um, you know, they raised us to know what it means to be black in America. And so I, as we traveled, I would notice that, you know, why is it the east side of town is always the black side of town? And why does it look like that? And why do you know, why aren't there similar opportunities across population groups and this and that? Um, and as we traveled, I really came to view the fact that, you know, no matter where we went, whether it was abroad or here in the United States, people are fundamentally the same. They mm -hmm. want security. They want prosperity. They want happiness. They want the opportunity to enjoy their families and pursue, you know, their best um, lives. Yeah. But not everybody has that opportunity. And so I became consumed with how do we fix that? And yeah. that led me to political science, uh, which also led me to public policy and I earned my PhD in uh, political science with an emphasis in public policy, came to Washington, D.C., and the rest is history. Yeah, there you go. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. It's like, I think from my vantage point, in a very siloed sort of way as a podcaster, as, as in, in the, the, the realm that I'm in, I try to think of how can I do the most good in, in the space that I'm in. And that's what I'm kind of hearing from like that background. How can I do the most good? How can I help the most people, the largest swath? So I, sh I tell people that my parents taught us that service is the price you pay for freedom in this country. And from very young age, we were taught to, you know, 
volunteer. I mean, before we could earn money legally, uh, we were in volunteer gigs, um, you know, wherever we happened to live. And, um, you know, my dad recently told me that he wanted us to know that um, he wanted us to divorce the idea of getting paid from everything that you do. Yeah. Uh, that you don't have to get paid for everything. In fact, you know, you should do some things just because it's a part of what your responsibility is as a civic actor or a human being. Um, and so we have carried, all of us, my sister, my brother, and I have carried that forward in terms of how we live our lives. Yeah. I, I used to hear that all the time. And um, this this notion of like service and being involved, community, giving back, all mm-hmm. of the different things, but in a true sense, right? Like, I don't need to do it through a company that I'm with. I need to just, I need to be the person that's doing it. Uh, and sometimes it's sharing what I might know, like, all right, put a couple hours here, put some hours there. And, um, I feel better for doing it. I feel like at least here in like this community, I feel like if people are maybe getting skills or their days are a little easier, that makes it like we're all more, we're all stronger. You know, here, I think if we're getting that, it makes it easier for all of us, I think. So when the pandemic hit, and now remember, I lost two elections. I had a preventative double mastectomy, um, and my husband had just died. Uh, and all of a sudden, the world stopped. And, um, you know, I, I took the time and space to use it for grieving uh, and to kind of regain my perspective on the world. But I also went to New Psalmist Baptist Church and I volunteered for their food distribution ministry. Yeah. And I was out there, you know, I think every week at that time, uh, giving food to the lineup of people who needed it because they lost their jobs and as a result of the pandemic. And every time I left, and then they would give us the opportunity to take bags of food to people who lived in our neighborhood. And I live on the west side. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I would always take bags of food to some people on my street. But every time I left there, I felt a sense of accomplishment. I felt, and it didn't give me the space to, I, I, who was I to, you know, I thought in my mind, you know, to wallow in, you know, my, my, you know, own emotions and, and whatnot when, you know, we had the opportunity to serve others and it made me feel good. And I do think that, um, volunteering does that to you if you, um, you know, do it in a way that kind of uplifts community. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I go back to one of these um, periods where it was, it was a weird period for me. Like I was sharing with you before we got started. I've been doing this for a very long time. And um, I left a job that I was at under weird circumstances. It was, a, it was a buyout and I just couldn't find work. So it's like I wasn't able to do this because I wasn't feeling fulfilled. I wasn't able to put the mic on. It's like my creativity suffered. And I needed to get off my ass, frankly. So I ended up going and volunteering at a um, museum and helping them with their social media needs. They needed hours. They needed someone in that spot. And, you know, I was down in the dumps. I was like, very, yeah, it's like the way that I lost that job. It was kind of, it was a little, a little depressed. It was, it was not good. It was not good. And I think going up there and having just been one, being around people, mm-hmm. but two people being like, man, you're killing it, man. We're getting picked up in different magazines and zines and papers mm-hmm. just from your efforts. And I was like, oh yeah, this is my value. This is a thing that I do. I am a person and, you know, really helping them along and getting eyes and ears on the work that they were doing. Cause you know, they were volunteering. It was the, um, I think it was like the Fire Museum of Maryland. Mm. So, you know, they're a lot volunteer based a lot of the times. And I'm like a lower level volunteer, but I'm like, I'm helping. And I felt really good about that. Absolutely. So I, I want to talk about diversity and inclusion a little bit, um, specifically in Baltimore. What is your vision? I, I like to get people, I like to get people's takes on things. Like, what's your vision on like diversity and inclusion in Baltimore in a very like macro sense? Like, are we doing well? Is it something that we've moved up? Is it where are we at? You know, challenges, things of that nature. What are your thoughts in that particular area here in Baltimore? Well, before I actually ascribe a value <laughs> to where we are in Baltimore. I would, no. <laughs> I would say that there are two words that describe my perspective on it, which is inclusive growth. That, um, that we have a huge opportunity here in Baltimore. Baltimore has everything. 
beautiful housing stock, beautiful waterfront, major world-class uh, universities. Yeah. You know, we have everything, a diversity of people, a lot who care, who are getting out there and trying to do social entrepreneurship, God's work, yeah. um, you know, and so the potential is so great. Uh, for um, going to just basically the next level of greatness. Uh, and so, you know, the question becomes is, you know, how do we get there and what's the pathway? And um, unfortunately, I do think that while there is there are so many assets here, um, and I don't want to take that away because there are assets, we have work to do, uh, especially when it comes to our kids. Um, you know, I do think that... Um, you know, um, we're leaving too much talent on the table, and and the talent is brilliant, yeah. uh, but they don't see the pathways um, to opportunity, and that means that we as adults have to do better. Um, we have a major problem with lopsided development. Um, we have too many, you know, um, neighborhoods that have been abandoned in terms of uh, strategic opportunities. Uh, and, and I don't want to see what happened in DC because I was in DC before it turned into, uh, Latte City because it's not Chocolate City anymore. Thank you. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely notorious. I appreciate that. I love it. Um, but, you know, I saw what happened and, and in DC, I think, um, while of course it, the transformation of the city has been, um, phenomenal in terms of the, its growth and its look and all that kind of thing, I think they pushed out too many low income population groups. Uh, and so with that, we have an opportunity here in Baltimore mm -hmm. to do, you know, how do you make sure that you can, that people of color and low income people can experience the upside of development? Yeah. I don't think that we've ever seen that done. We have the opportunity to do that here in Baltimore. Uh, and so, you know, there are all kinds of policy strategies that can be enacted in order to stabilize the existing population mm -hmm. while encouraging and incentivizing people to take these empty homes and uh, make them tax productive. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, the opportunity in Baltimore is stratospheric. Yeah. It is absolutely awe-inspiring if you think about it. But it needs the right execution strategy. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'll be, I, I find sometimes when I'm talking with people, people are like, yeah, I'm going to say it in this way and it's great. And then I'm like, yeah, also. <laughs> and I find that one of the things that I describe with people when things that, that don't quite make sense, right? And I always talk about, like, over here, we're recording this in East Baltimore, near the Los Rios Johns Hopkins University. And, you see properties that are available that are at a certain price point, right? But then the city is too, you know, this or that for people to move in. It's so dangerous and so on. It's like, how are you building more places for people to live in a city that's too dangerous and at this rate? I say, like, I feel like somebody sees the opportunity, but the messaging are kind of weird. So some of these things don't come in. So like where we're at, I know that I've been rallying for specifically in this area. Can we get a market here? And well, we haven't got, I was like, okay, tell me more. And that's, that's the thing. I was like, make it make sense to me. I am a relatively smart person, but make it make sense of you can build out these properties, have high rises, everything is gentrification gray and it's more and more of them. But then there's nothing for the people that are here of varying incomes of varying backgrounds. So what I find interesting, and I don't, by the way, I don't have a lot of insight because the, the, the process is so opaque. It's not transparent. Yeah. But from what I am able to discern or my guesstimate is, is that, you know, that developers have a lot of sway here and they have the ability to dictate in which direction in the city uh, gets built up. And it's, you know, basically um, core to their wealth creation. Uh, and I think a lot of the, you know, the old time neighborhoods are not in their strategic plan. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, those areas get overlooked. And by the way, some of them are being primed. So you're in a space mm -hmm. that's being primed. It's not prime time yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they, they've got your area staked out. <laughs> yeah. But for them, you know, they look at everything from demographics to income level to this to that. They're building out the infrastructure. There will come a day when yeah. the market will be there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the question is, will you be there? <laughs> uh, this, is, this is true. And, this is I, true. and I will ask you to hold on to that property with everything you got. Do not give it up. Absolutely. 
because, you know, this is where wealth is made. When you hold on to, um, you know, you can either, you know, buy in a space and, and be a lo- uh, space that's already developed and just be a long time holder of uh, real estate and experience equity increases over time. Um, by the way, that usually works typically well for white communities. Sure. Um, there is data and research that shows that if, um, if the population group that is, uh, populating that area is predominantly black or brown, that the, um, the wealth creation doesn't come, uh, as significantly. Uh, even in a place, oddly enough, like Prince George's County, which is right next door to our nation's capital, yeah. um, that, you know, that, um, wealth we uh, we don't generate wealth from our property ownership as much if if they're black neighborhoods. Hmm. That being said, the exception is, and and the reason I'm telling you this is because I experienced it. When I first moved to D.C., um, they were calling Outer Capitol Hill Beirut because there were so many shootings. Wow. There was so much gun violence. There was people were literally hiding in their homes. Yeah. I lived at Tenth and Constitution, and yet there were certain areas of Capitol Hill I, I would not go into past dark. Yeah. Um, uh, over time, several years later, I was able to buy a home in an area called what they call it Eckington slash Bloomingdale. It's right south of Howard, the okay. Joint Park area. Yeah. Um, and when I bought down there, a lot of my friends said, oh, the boom will never reach down there. Why are you buying down there? It's never going to reach down there. Literally, you know, we had corner stores where they had plexiglass. They were selling single malt cans of malt liquor. You could go and buy a single, you know, uh, <laughs> cigarettes. Yeah. Um, I remember having a party and looking out uh, the side my window, and there was this trash up and down the street. And I was just like, I don't want my guests to see my, my neighborhood like this. And I went out and I went and picked up every single pit, bit of trash on the street. Literally. Within the space of 10 years, Mm -hmm. that entire census tract, there was an article in the Washington Post saying that my census tract, where I bought my very first home, was the most rapidly gentrifying census tract in the nation, not just in D.C., in the nation. It flipped from majority black to majority white in the space of 10 years between 2000 and 2010. Wow. (laughs) That investment in my first home? Yeah was a nine times increase in terms of when I, when I sold it. And unfortunately I sold it. Yeah. I needed the money. Yeah. But when I sold it, it was a nine times increase over what I paid for. That is wealth creation. Yeah. And that is going to happen in areas across this, this city. Yeah. Uh, if we ever get to that point of getting out of our own way in terms of real estate. Now the question is, is how do you do it in a way that doesn't push people out? Mm-hmm. And that is the one hundred million dollar question, and I think um, there are ways to do it. Okay. I love it. I love. I love it here. I feel like I'm learning something as we're talking, and it's, it's got it's got everything. Just the hamster wheel is just going. So, I, I, th- you, you, I think you touched on this, but let's. I think one can construe from what you were saying a moment ago touches on this, but I want to maybe focus in the cultural area, right? Yeah. So as a person that's, you've traveled, uh, you know, Instagram, I see travels at times. <laughs> um, and as, as a citizen of the world, you hear different things about Baltimore. And I think we were talking about that a little bit beforehand. What would you say one of the bigger misconceptions is that people have about this city? Like, I, I, I think part of this podcast came out of, I don't think anybody knows what's happening here. You know, I don't think anybody knows about this culture, this, you know, this creative economy that we have oh here, the social innovation, fantastic. all of this different stuff. So what would you say that biggest, like, misconception or some of the bigger misconceptions you hear of in conversation? Like, you're from Baltimore? You're in Baltimore? Why are you yeah. in Baltimore? So one thing that I think that came out during when, when Donald Trump attacked my late husband, Elijah, um, and was poo-pooing Baltimore as this, you know crazy place where crime and all this kind of stuff, um, rats were taking over. Um, it came out that, you know, Baltimore has, um, some of the most prosperous black people in America. (laughs) And everybody was like scratching their heads, like looking around like, what? What? Yes. (laughs) And so the data, um, you know, shows that, you know, the, the black middle class in Baltimore is prospering and Mm -hmm. thriving and people would not know that. 
uh, except for, you know, um, the data. Yep. Um, another thing is that the arts community is so tremendous. There are just amazing artists working across genres. And part, I think part of it is because, you know, we have Micah here, but a part of it is because I think that there are talented young people who take the inspiration from the grid of the city, their experiences, and they just transform it into beautiful, unique works of art. And I think it's inspired a, 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 a counterculture movement that undergirds the economy. We don't think about how the arts actually contribute to our community. And we think about it in terms of maybe the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, mm -hmm. or, but we don't think about it in terms of all these hustling entrepreneurs yeah. who are doing like fantastic stuff. And so I have been blessed to be have exposure to that too. And then there is this whole community of social entrepreneurs. I mentioned this earlier. Yeah. But a lot of people are taking a look at the challenges and the problems of the city and they are not sitting back and waiting for, you know, um, government actors or somebody else to, to figure out the job. They're yeah. applying creativity and developing C3s and, you know, applying for grants and, or even hustling out of their pocket, yeah. uh, to meet need. Uh, and, and that element of our economy is tremendous as well. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a huge economy here in that area. We have this DIY culture that's here. Um, and makerspace is yeah, growing. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And I think creatively, you know, you may have, you know, buildings that are in disrepair, but then you have really good, like, street art there, murals and so on, that I think improves the quality of looking at maybe something that without it is is like i don't look bad but oh wow that's, that's the building that has that mural on it hope someone redoes it and keeps that mural you know and i think it adds seasoning to the city and it's very unique to the city and i think in terms of like let's say the street art i think that's what gives it its character so i find like I use Starbucks as, as like almost a litmus test. If I go to a Starbucks, let's say in New Orleans, I'm going to know it's a New Orleans Starbucks. Sometimes when I go to a Starbucks here, yeah, I'm like, can we get something in Los Baltimore, please? Can we get something? I don't want oh, an Obey Latte. I don't want that. But I want something that feels like that character is here. But I think that character is presented in the street art and in this kind of DIY thing that we do here. Yeah. Um and, and the street art is actually, I think it's important to point out that um, a lot of the street art is subsidized, that Johns Hopkins has a mural program, the city has a mural program. And so, um, you know, I think that there are some pretty incredibly important institutions who have paid artists to actually help make our environment better. Yeah. Um, so let's not overlook that. No, that's, yeah. that's absolutely. And um, I remember the homie Gaia, I remember Adam Stad working with the Orioles and seeing some of their work there. And I uh, worked for the Orioles when I was an undergrad. So I'm like, it's all coming together, man. I was feeling really good seeing like them working that way. And it's like, these are street guys that are now here in this major league ballpark stadium that you know, thousands of people are going to see and is seeing your work that aren't necessarily from here. And that's really dope. Absolutely. So I want to talk about, um, I think this is a, I think this is a great question, actually. <laughs> um, describe your philosophy on networking. Mm. Um, are you good at working at room or, mm. you, or do you prefer using like the LinkedIn approach? What is your, your approach, uh, your philosophy around networking? Both. Okay. Both in. I'm, I'm that way. And by the way, when I first moved to, um, the D.C. area. I moved to D.C. in 1997. And I keep talking about D.C. because that's where my first exposure to the reason. I moved to Baltimore in 2008 when I got married. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I came through a uh, program called the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, it was a fellowship program for graduate students who, you know, wanted to work in D.C. Sure. And um, one thing I noticed uh, when I worked on Capitol Hill is that there is, there's, there's no linearity. Somebody who is your intern one day could be your boss the next. Yeah. <laughs> and so that means that if you are thinking that, oh, well, I can only speak to and hobnob with the, the person at the head of the table or the person with the biggest title or the person with... Absolutely not. That yeah. is just the fallacy of, I think... Um, uh, a certain perspective on networking. Networking is just being good to everybody, mm -hmm. whether it's the security guard uh, out front, whom, by the way, I'm just noticing are populating. I just thought that they were assigned to like 
each building. The yeah. fact of the matter is they, they work all these buildings. <laughs> they do, yeah. Um, so I'm walking into another building today and I'm saying, oh, you, you work with my office. Um, whether it's the security guards or the janitors or, you know, the interns, you, you my mother taught me that you don't ever think that you're better than anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that means that you communicate with people on the level of your common humanity, whoever they are, mm-hmm. whatever uniform they're wearing, whatever their title might be. And, and, and you're not putting on airs. You're not, you know, trying to be sedity. Um, <laughs> you're just being you yeah. and, and trying to find out who they are. And I find that when you ask people about themselves, they usually tell you and then you begin to, you know, develop relationships, and then that becomes networking. And I always used to tell, I, I came to D.C. as a Congressional Buck Caucus Fellow. I ended up mentoring a lot of um, cl- subsequent cohorts of interns and fellows. And I would always tell them what I just told you, you know, make sure that you're treating everyone with respect and that you are. Um, communicating with everyone, but also understand that these are your professional peers. If you're fortunate, you know, they'll be your professional cohort for the rest of your life. Yeah. And, and you want to make sure that you're not unnecessarily burning bridges. Totally. Totally. And I, I think that's one of the qualities that I had to try to learn and especially in applying with doing this, this series and, you know, people ask me, oh, you only talk to, like, who's really popping or who's the biggest names? I was like, no, I talk to everyone that I think has something interesting that has an interesting story, interesting perspective that I think is doing good stuff for Baltimore or whatever city I might be talking, you know, talking about at the time. And I think that's what's giving it that crossover appeal. It's not like you're swinging for the fences every time. It's like you're talking to emerging artists. You're talking to established people, people who are elders, people who are doing all types of stuff. And it's crossover appeal. And that's the way I try to like navigate. And I find that when I'm in those spaces that aren't really doing that, it's like, oh, I got to leave. I can't be in here. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. And and I thought I was bad for a long time at networking. It's just like, no, I see the strings. I think that's what it is. And I, I just don't have the stomach for the strings. Um, and also you have these, um, what is it? These, these markers of where you're at. And it's like, oh, well, you're in this row. Because I find because I might not network in a certain way that I'm not invited to a certain room. Hmm. And that just doesn't work. You yeah. know, like, oh, well... We didn't invite you to this big conference for the let's name the next great podcast or next great, you know, arts advocate or what have you. It's just like, well, maybe I didn't talk to the right person. And I used to get really bent out of shape about it. But I'm like, no, I'm doing doing what I'm what I think is right. And I'm talking to everyone. And if I'm supposed to be in there, I'll be in there. Mm. And that's that's the way I kind of look at it versus trying to swing for the fences, because I think. People can read that and they can see that. And it's like, this is all who you talk to. And by the way, when you say swing for the fences, you mean like, you know, just fight your way to the top? Just just going for like, this is the biggest name in a room oh, that I has see. the most clout attached to it. I see. Yeah. I got you. I, 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 I think that when you're organic and authentic, then, you know, maybe your um, penetration and rise won't be as quick, but I'll tell you what, you're, it's not going to be as, um, it'll be longstanding. Yeah. Um, it will be, um, you know, exactly when you need it and it will be, um, you know, appreciated by all. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's very true. Uh, so I got a couple more questions and I got those rapid fire questions. I got those rapid fire. Everyone's afraid of those. Uh, I don't know why. I mean, I, I think they're great. Um, I don't never have, I never have to answer them though, but I think they're great. Um, so in terms of, in terms of doing one thing well, and I, I think that I can hold a conversation. I think Mm -hmm. that that's the thing that I do well in terms of doing one thing. Well, what would you say your, your, your superpower is in that regard? I think writing. Yeah. I think, um, I think I'm a pretty good writer and I've always, um, my, my undergraduate, um, roommate and girlfriend and soror, uh, who just happens to actually live here too with her husband. She reminded me that I once said, uh, in undergrad that, you know, as long as I can write, I'll always be okay. Um, so I do think it's, it's writing. Okay. 
And notice that's that's the that's the situation right there. Oh. Yeah, okay. so I, I'm Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, um, okay. made at Prairie View A and M in spring of 1992. Uh, I, li- I like that. I like it. <laughs> I like that. It's just like here's my call number. Here's everything. <laughs> I was number 30 <laughs> of 35. And that's the great. reason why that's on the fresh on my mind is because we just had our 30th anniversary. I was number 30 and this is our 30th year since yeah. we pledged. Yeah. When those, those, when those numbers hit, it's like, you know, because we're in what, uh, 2022, it's like, yeah. yeah, it's two, 22, 22. It's like, you got to have something. This is like a palindrome or something. You got to have something. Yeah. Um, so this, I guess this will be the, the last, the last one I have of the real questions. Um, how do you, <laughs> this, the, yeah, this is, this is a little bit of a loaded one, I think. What is your definition of professionalism? And mm. do you feel that your perspective as a person, as a black woman is, um, is considered in that larger kind of scope of professionalism? Cause you hear that mm. all the time. You hear that in leadership conversations. I was headed from the day job to come over here to get into creative mode. Mm. And I think that there's a, an approach one takes. I've been called unprofessional a few times, which I always feel weird about. And it's like, how do we define professionalism? So I want to get your take on that. For me, professionalism is executing with excellence. Yeah. Um, it's focusing on, you know, have, having standards of performance. Mm-hmm. Uh, and communication that are a, you know, not biased or coming from, you know, necessarily, uh, an emotional space, but from the desire to perform well, uh, and to, um, and recognizing the importance of team dynamics and relationships in order to perform well. So, you know, for me, that is what professionalism is. And by the way, um, this comes up for me now because I, I don't know if you, you'd never probably knew Vernon Sims. He was my late husband's chief of staff for years, and he was also uh, the chief of staff to Kwai Z and Fume before he was my late husband's chief of staff. He died yesterday. And everybody to a T says that Vernon was a professional, a consummate professional. And he was. I mean, he just focused on, you know, um, executing um, with um, high standards. Uh, He focused on making sure that everybody uh, was heard and had their needs met as as was required. Um, And, you know, when he asserted himself, he he did it in a way that was empathetic but effective. And so, you know, to me, that is what being a consummate professional is. Thank you for sharing that. With, uh, rest in peace. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I, I think that that word is always weird when it comes to, like, black people in certain spaces of, oh, well, I don't know if that's professional. And or I think in the instances where I've heard it, it's usually I was kind of a level above a person and they needed to use this to bring it down because being on task, doing things in a certain way and pursuing excellence in that way was important to me. And it's just like, you didn't really do that. Right. It's like, well, you're being unprofessional. You should have, you know, you should have came to me in a different way. I was like, I emailed you or I communicated it to you in an agreed upon way. It's just, you got triggered or you had an emotional reaction to it and you're trying to project that upon me. And that's, that's the thing I find weird. Like you kind of, it kind of slid off the shoulder, if you will, but also it was one of those things that you had, that I noticed. So there's the people dynamic. <laughs> there's the institutional environmental dynamic mm-hmm. there. So, and then there's the, um, you know, so for example, for a long time, black women with braids or with natural hair uh, weren't considered to be professional mm-hmm. uh, in a traditional um, office setting. Yeah. And, um, you know, now I think there's broad recognition that that is biased. Uh, and there's even now a law that says that it's illegal. Yes. <laughs> um, and so, you know, if that were the standard of professionalism, it would have unnecessarily discriminated against black women as it has for a very long time. And hopefully the law makes a difference. But that is, you know, um, institutional culture. Yeah. Um, and then the people dynamic is the hardest thing. Mm-hmm. Because as you mentioned, you never know uh, what triggers people. Um, you never know. Uh, you know, I, I got to a point where I started asking new hires, um, 
you know, how they like to receive feedback. Uh, because, you know, some people find it hard, um, to receive feedback that's direct. <laughs> some people find it, you know, and so to, for them to tell me how they like to receive feedback then gives me insight in terms of how we can communicate in the future where you don't just automatically raise your hackles if, um, you know, I'm sharing something that I've observed. Yeah. So, you know, um, I think that we all have to be sensitive to each other and, you know, the things that, um, you know, cause us, um, you know, anger or discomfort or, uh, and, you know, if we're professional, we won't bring that to the, <laughs> to the professional space. But, you know, that's not the case. We're all human beings. And I think that, um, many people, you know, um, are evolving in terms of their professionalism. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, you know, with that, you have to just be sensitive, um, to how people are. Yeah. And I, I'll chime in on, on that. Um, I think my, uh, favorite way of receiving feedback is my favorite meal with no words being exchanged. It's like, oh yeah, just make it in pasta. I don't, I don't care. Uh, so, so actually that's all of, I think it's a good place for us to start with the real questions. And I got a couple, uh, rapid fire questions for you. Um, don't do what we do. Don't overthink them. That's what we do. Okay. All right. <laughs> just, just, yeah. <laughs> just, let me get ready. Yourself. Let me get ready. Let me get ready. Okay. All right. All right. Go, go. All right. Uh, what is a, <laughs> what is a, a movie that you legitimately enjoy, but you know, it's bad. You know, this is a bad movie. It's whack, but you're like, I love it. 16 it's candles. Okay. It's, it's, it's Rocky five. It's Rocky four for me. Okay. <laughs> Rocky four. I, I don't remember what, which Rocky. I enjoyed the Rocky series. He stopped but... the Russians in that one. Oh yeah. <laughs> I watched them all by the way. <laughs> well, shout out to you on that one. Yeah. Um, but 16 candles, corny, formulaic, um, but I watched it like 25 times. <laughs> um, and the rock movie is just a long music video as well. <laughs> um, what is the best country you visited in terms of the things that, that you're into? Like, I'm really into arts, culture, what have you. The first thing I do when I get off the plane is where's the best coffee shop I'm going in now? Bags are in my hands. So in terms of the things that you really look for and you really dig, what is the best country you visited? I love Brazil. Mm. And I've been to almost every corner of Brazil and all of the major cities. And I love Salvador Bahia. Um, the richness of the culture, a lot of it is black culture because it was like one of the major in the first stops yeah. from Sub-Saharan Africa on the slave trade. Uh, and so to, you know, to experience that culture, to experience their, um, their norms and their customs uh, was, you know, phenomenal for me. And I've been like, I, I don't know, maybe a dozen times. Um, but I always look forward to going back. You're still going to take it to Brazil. I've never been, so I need to just make a... <laughs> Get, 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 get that sort no, of I haven't been under this current president. I, from what I understand, it's like having Donald Trump as president all over again. But, you know, when I was there, it was the heyday of Lula, who is actually running for president again. And I don't know what his prospects are, but we'll see. Uh, what was the last gift you received? You know, I get these gifts all the time. <laughs> and I just got a phenomenal T-shirt. <laughs> And it has a gentleman, I think his name is Robert Lee. Uh, you know, some people call him Robert Watkins. Uh, some people call him just Rob Lee. And it says on it, it says MTR Podcast. And it's a lovely red tank top, which I will be wearing. And you will be seeing on Instagram at some point soon. Shout out to you. That Thank is, that you is for great. this lovely gift. Oh, you're welcome. That's great. <laughs> Studio visits always get stuff. <laughs> um, last two I got. Um... This this is funny. Uh, what is? Do you have a nickname? What is your nickname? My mother called me Miyoshi. My sister called me Miyoshi Bida. And um, you know, it's it's cute. Um, it's left over from our childhood. I call her Mare Bear. Her name is Meredith. Uh, her middle name is Brandine. And somehow along the way, I got Mare Bear out of that. And and she, we all know who we're talking about when we're saying this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but it's our you know it's our nicknames for each other. We, we had no seasoning in the household, so I just, like, my dad never had a nickname. His was just Rob, so mine is just Junior. <laughs> that's the, that's the, the extent of the creativity in the, the whole household. And lastly, what is one item that is, like, on your bucket list that you're like, I want to check this off? I could check this off in the next year or so. What is one item that's Ooh, on your bucket list? That's a good one. I, I want to get to Cape Town, South Africa. Mm. That is, I just, for some reason, I feel like there is something waiting there for me. I have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm. 
but that is my bucket list. And I've never been, by the way, to Sub-Saharan Africa. I had a ticket to Zanzibar last year for early December, and then um, uh, the Omicron wave hit, and it started in Southern Africa, and they told us not to travel to Southern Africa, and so I canceled. So I'm looking forward to getting there, and hopefully soon. Thank you. Yeah. So that's it. That's, that's, that's the end of it. It's the end of the hot seat. So, um, one, I want to thank you for coming onto the podcast. And two, I want to invite and encourage you to uh, share with the fine folks, the listeners, um, anything that you feel like we didn't really cover or where to find you at. You know, the floor is yours. So, shameless plugs or what have you, the floor is yours. Wow. Anything uh, that I want to cover? Yeah, I, for- I, I don't know. <laughs> but what I will say is I really enjoyed this uh, time with you. And thank you so much for inviting me on. I think that I originally got invited because I'm a, I'm a supporter of the arts, having served on the Baltimore Museum of Art board at one point. And I'm passionate about equity in the arts. And so, you know, I thank you for uplifting artists, uh, particularly the artist community here. I think it's essential. And uh, congratulations to you on your essential podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. So there you have it, folks. For for the great Maya Rocky Moore Cummings, I am Rob Lee saying that there is art, community, culture in and around Baltimore. You just got to look for it. <laughs>